Hello everyone, this is Tittle Tattle with Asantua. I'm Marion, your host. Welcome to Did You Know This? Did you know that what you become does not always depend on your beginnings? Our guest today started off with a degree in biological sciences and ended up in the field of civil engineering. With determination and dint of hard work, she rose through the ranks of academia and attained the status of full professor of civil engineering. The first female to accomplish this in Ghana. She is the foundation vice chancellor of the University of Energy and Natural Resources. Our guest has been decorated with a number of awards, including the UNESCO Mudialogo Award in 2007 and Presidential Award for Officer of the Order of Volta for her contribution in engineering, environmental and sanitation education in Ghana in 2016. Our guest is a wife to a professor and mother to two sons. She is a woman of faith and worships with the Methodist Church of Ghana. She has been singing and playing the piano in church for many years and still does this. She is currently on post-retirement contract at the Department of Civil Engineering at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, my conversation today is with Professor Mrs. E.C. Welcome, Prof. Thank Tittle Tattle. Thank you very much. <laughs> so it's very good to have you here, and uh, I would like you to share with viewers and listeners a bit more about your background, aside what I have mentioned. Well, um, thank you very much. I was born at Akimoda, uh, and then I went to Akimoda Angakan Primary, Odaan Secondary School, Every Girls for my sixth form. And then later on, I joined the university, as you have clearly stated. And now, uh, I am Esi Ewa from my initial name, which was uh, Augustina. Many people oh, don't okay. know this. <laughs> I don't know I that. Used to be Augustina. Your box name, yes, right? <laughs> Augustina. Uh, sorry, that's my father's name. Okay. But when I got married, I changed my name. I changed the Christian name and then became... Uh, Mrs. E.C. Ewa. That is all I can say about myself. You said most of the things. So. Okay, Prof. Mm -hmm. um, then I would like to know how did you end up in civil engineering first? Because you started off in the College of Science, doing biological sciences. <laughs> yes, uh, after I completed my BSc education, Professor Wright, who was the then head of Department of Civil Engineering, was looking for somebody who has a background in microbiology to come to civil engineering and help with the development of the kvi pillar train and initially when he said this i didn't want to come to engineering i told him that i don't want to go and do any mathematics because <laughs> engineering is all about math but he told me that we need microbiologists people with biological science background to determine the type of pathogens that are in human feces and how long these uh, microorganisms will die if they are in a pit so he took me around and we collected samples from uh, pit latrines and then i was examining the type of uh, pathogens that are present particularly ascaris because ascaris is a helminth egg which stays in the soil for a long time and then I became his research assistant and I, assist, I, I assisted him with the practicals in the environmental quality engineering lab because there I realized that biologists are needed in the department of civil engineering because water treatment involves microorganisms, wastewater treatment also involves microorganisms. And then fortunately for me, after uh, we had worked on the KVIP, there was a call by the UN for the National Water and Sanitation Decade. And so I was given a scholarship to go to the US and study. I did environmental science then, looking at pathogens in human feces and how they are destroyed from fecal sludge in the US. 
And then I came back. I worked for some time and then I had to go and do another PhD and the PhD was more in wastewater treatment which is part of sanitary engineering a key component in civil engineering and that is how I ended up here uh, in the <laughs> department okay prof I'm just wondering engineering at the time was uh, male dominated it still is how did you survive in this new environment which was also very much male dominated actually i wasn't really bothered whether i was a, a female or a, a, a male working in in, uh, in engineering because uh, i had wanted to do engineering when i was in secondary school and I actually opted to do biology chemistry physics and uh, add math in those days but i went to a mid school and i taught the class so the boys came to beat me in class <laughs> that uh, after a teacher has told them that why will you sit down for a woman to top the class and so i became their enemy and because i was the only girl doing that i stopped uh, doing art maths oh, okay and so i wasn't afraid and then also i've also uh, been uh, the only girl uh, among several of my aunts or children i would say my cousins and they are all men so when they climb trees i climb with them uh, i even wanted to ride a bike with them but my grandmother would not allow that <laughs> she said i'll become a bad girl so for, for, for boys uh, i am used to them and i and i'm not really uh, bothered too much uh, by being here and and i have to say that the the colleagues here are very hospitable they, they received me very very well because i was the only female at that time in the department and so they, they treated me like a queen to mm. be precise <laughs> all right did you encounter any challenges uh, along the way professionally uh, the not, not, not really because you know i saw that i have to teach wastewater treatment and i have to do some uh, maths and I noticed that the mass that I have to study for wastewater treatment wasn't really much. First order reaction kinetics and second order reaction Basics. kinetics. Yes, yeah, so uh, I was uh, comfortable now with it. And so I, I wouldn't say I faced any challenge because in my uh, life, I've decided that if you are given a job, you have to do it well. And even if you don't know, you have to study it. So I used to sit in their lectures. Mm. I used to sit in uh, lectures when they were teaching uh, wastewater treatment, water treatment, to know what really I have put myself into. And then also when I give a project, I don't allow the students to be on their own. I will go with the field, uh, to the field with them to look at what is really happening, what is wastewater treatment. So I've been to a number of waste treatment plants uh, in Ghana and also here at KNUSD I've looked uh, at their wastewater treatment plant comprehensively and I remember at one time I had to be with a student who was monitoring the flow rate of wastewater which was going into the Asafo wastewater uh, treatment plant and I learned how to determine a uh, flow weight composite sample and then one day I had some visitors from the World Bank and they were looking for me and my kids were saying uh, mother why is it that these people are following you what do they want from you and I told them that they want to know how flow weight composite samples are taken <laughs> all this I learned on my own uh, and I know that if you learn on your own you will know because knowledge is, is not hidden yeah. it's, it's everywhere and you can be what you want to be and so that is how uh, i wouldn't say uh, i would say uh, how far i have come uh, in the department okay did you have to make any sacrifices at all along the way of your career in order to get ahead uh, and hmm. would you like to share a few well what sacrifice did i make i am a woman of a vision i pursue my vision and I wouldn't say that I had to sacrifice because my work and my God, to be precise, were my passion. And so 
I love doing the work I was doing. Some people were calling me shit microbiologist, <laughs> shit engineer, but I wasn't really bothered. I listened to all of these and I said, well, I'm, I am achieving my aim. So I wouldn't say that I had any challenge, but to be honest, if I look at the housework, you'll be asking questions on that. So the housework you have to do, and sometimes you need help, then you see that you have to work extra hard as a woman. And so that could be a challenge, but uh, to me, it's not really a big challenge. So that will bring me to my next question of yes. how did you juggle your role as a wife and mother and then an academic? I always had a timetable that I follow. So my timetable became part of me. What I do every day, every time I had this. But um, I also use house helps to help me. And I have to say that my mother too uh, was very helpful, particularly when I had my first child in the U.S. And I was uh, studying. I had to go to the lab at 2 a.m. with my son at my back, carrying him and working. Okay, a lot of young career women have challenges with who to trust with the domestic assistance. Mm. How, what would be your advice to such a young woman who is struggling to discern who they should bring to their space to assist? Well, as a woman of prayer, I pray a lot. And then I make sure that the people who come to live with me are people that my relatives know have good character and I treat them like my children there's no discrimination they eat what I eat sometimes they determine what I can be eating <laughs> and they, they are like my my children they are always calling me anytime they even leave me and are outside they still come to me and I, I have to say that if you have a, a house girl or house boy and you treat him well you will have your peace. Plus, I also, every morning, we do quiet time. This is quiet time. I preach to them about the importance of life. And sometimes I even take them uh, subjects in environmental uh, science or wastewater treatment. I teach them how wastewater is treated and how we should also ensure that we manage our waste properly. So if you do that, you are very fortunate. Some uh, you you'll be very happy. Sometimes, if I hear how others are treating people as if they are not human beings, it is wrong. The Bible tells us that we were all created in the image of God. Identify the potential in that person. I'm happy to say that one of my house girls, huh? The the daughters are currently two of them are here at KNUST. One is a first class student in chemistry. And the other is doing civil engineering. The other lady is also going to do science. And hopefully uh, she will come to electrical engineering. What a joy to see that somebody who stayed with you because of your education and advice, her children are in the university. I, I can tell from your facial expression that you, you feel very fulfilled yes. in, in accomplishing these things. Prof, let's fast forward to Vice Chancellor of a new university. <laughs> How did it happen? Were you approached? Did you see the adverts on TV in the newspapers? Please share with us. Well, it was not like that. I organized the first presidential debate on sanitation in the whole world. And when I organized this, I invited all the presidents, uh, presidential candidates okay. who have representatives in parliament to come to KNUST. Please, do you remember the year? I think I may have forgotten, maybe 2008 or something. Okay. I, may, I have to say that. And then when it was, I organized this, uh, Dr. Christina Mwakunyama represented the NDC. And so when the NDC came to power, and they wanted to form a university you, you must have a woman so she she called and said that 
she would like me to be on a committee that is going to develop the two universities and he said this is a government thing it's it's a national it's not party please which two universities energy and uh... energy and uh, you has okay okay in of, yes okay so, health and life sciences but as a woman of god everything you want me to do for my country i will do it because of course i've had full scholarship throughout my life at the uh, secondary school i didn't pay any school fees at uh, university i didn't pay any school <laughs> fees uh bsc i didn't msc a PhD. I didn't pay anything. So you enjoyed. I enjoyed selling my country. <laughs> the, the, days, so, the days when you were giving pocket <laughs> money. <laughs> yeah. So it was a, a nice time. So uh, I we were three. Three of us were nominated from KNUSC, but the others two, uh, the other two, they did not go to the meeting at all. Uh, they, they 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 couldn't do it. I don't know why, but I offered not to stop sometimes i have to rent a car and a driver and pay the driver we were not given money every time we go for meetings but i i i did it because it's it's for my nation mm, very sacrificial yes i said why can't i do this for my nation and i always wanted something new because I had been looking at the KNUST programs and I was thinking that we have to do something for this nation. Look at our educational system and ensure that we are producing the right kind of students who will have an impact in this nation to move our nation forward. So I stayed throughout. And then I became the leader for the University of Energy and natural resources so after i had uh, submitted everything uh, to the chair and we have all agreed on it i had forgotten about it you submitted your report yes, to yes the and then to the, <laughs> yes the, we met the mills was then in power president okay. mills so we presented our things to him me i forgotten i came back to knusc and actually i saw that i was due for sabbatical and i wanted to go to rajas university because i had been communicating with rajas university and they wanted to build liberia university they had received about 100 million dollars and i was so happy so at that time also i developed about 25 programs because i knew that uh, we'll be going to liberia to rehabilitate and reorganize the university to be on a sound footing and so uh, I wanted to go to Rogers. Plus, my mother was in the US, and then I was told that one of my sons have a very nice apartment, <laughs> and it's so close, a two minute walk. So I wanted to go and do my sabbatical there and go and live in that apartment because he wanted to go to Harvard University, and I was really excited. And then the convener called me and said that, AC, you have to send your application for the vice chancellor position at UNE because you have virtually written everything so who can beat you send your application I didn't mind I said I won't go <laughs> and then I could see God's command in her voice and then she said you have gone to do all this who do you think should go and, and, and do it you have to send your application and nobody can beat you all along I had planned to be the vice chancellor of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. So I had, I had applied during LS time. But before that, I went to uh, Takrade uh, Polytechnic. The, the rector position was vacant. I was preparing myself for, for <laughs> Kwame Nkrumah University. So I did everything. What does it need uh, to build an academic place of excellence? Your strategic so, plan yes. and everything. So I knew all the, all the pillars uh, to form a good university. I, I went, but I was told that I, as usual, I won, but uh, the winning sometimes it has other issues. But I wasn't bothered about that because I had said that even if I, I win, I'm not going to go. I'm just you going. You mean the polytechnic? Yes, I was just going to try. It was <laughs> an experiment. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't bother going there. 
And then I applied to be a vice chancellor at KNUSC. I said so to myself. So the polytechnic was the first attempt? Yes, I, first attempt. yes, okay. yes, to try and see uh, what really goes into it. Okay. But then I, I also applied for the Kwame Nkrumah University one. My husband saw some leadership qualities in me. And so he asked me, is he, can you be I said, why not? I've seen all the VCs from uh, Bavoko at this time. <laughs> so I, I said, what, is, what do they do that I cannot do? Because I have a vision for this place. But I, I didn't win. And so all along, you see that the vice chancellorship is in me. Even though, so you dream yes, big, right? <laughs> I, I dreamt big because I said, what are they doing that I cannot do? Sometimes I even look at their mistakes and I think I can even correct them. So, <laughs> so you see, when she said this, that I have to come, uh, I put my application. It was so easy for me because I've done it twice. Mm -hmm. And then we lost a colleague. So... I was about to wake up and then all of a sudden I saw in a vision Professor Mrs. A.C. Ewa, Vice Chancellor of the University of Energy and Natural Resources with greater than and equal to four years at the back of the daily graphic <laughs> and then I said to myself God is talking to me if I don't go for this interview and get appointed as a vice chancellor of this university, if I go to the U.S., life will not be easy for me. So I knew that I had to go. And so I submitted my application and then I was called for interview. I don't know who else also applied, but I was, uh, I won uh, and I was made the vice chancellor of the University of Energy and Natural Resources because I knew that it was God who was sending me there. And that is how I ended up at the university. All right. Um, I, so you would attribute it to the hand of God. Yes. But then you also cooperated with the will of God. Yes. <laughs> and you have shared two instances of you applying to yeah. the Polytechnic yeah. and also applying mm. to KNUST mm. for the high officers of my chancellor. Prof, which other leadership positions did you occupy along the way or the journey that you looking back you think equipped you and really prepared you for this high office that you eventually occupied i think that knwc really prepared me i became the head of the department of civil engineering the dean of civil and geomatic engineering and also there was another department environment and technology I was also the, the HOD. I was also the, the head of the, the section, environmental quality engineering. And then also I became the African representative for the Organization of Women in Science for the developing world. And I'm also a leader in the Methodist Church. So all these things were preparing me. In fact, I've been a leader even in primary school. I was the girls prefect in primary school. I was the <laughs> girls prefect uh, in secondary school at Odan school. And then when I went to Ebri Girls, I was the chapel prefect. So leadership has been going along with me. And normally it is how hard you work. People see you and then they see that you, if we entrust this, uh, work with this person, she will do it well. And I think uh, this philosophy in life has been my guiding principle to honor God everywhere I go and never to disgrace the one who has called me. Now you've been appointed as the foundation vice chancellor of a university which did not exist before. <laughs> what, what were some of the major hurdles you had to overcome initially and then even throughout your tenure? Well, when you are appointed as a leader of a university which does not exist <laughs> and you have to start, uh, you will need some direction. And in fact, 
I had composed what I wanted that university because I was there. We wrote, the yes, and, 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 and we wrote everything. And then I went there with my vision. What I want, the programs that I want, programs that I saw in KNUST, which were not uh, to my satisfaction. And then also programs that were not being run in universities to develop the country. So every day I was thinking about it. How do I go about programs? And then I, I write, these are the programs I have to do. And then uh, the program that I have to do, I have to justify them. So I justify the programs that must be done. And I share it with my colleagues. Uh, my pro vice chancellor, uh, Professor Obiofori, was so cooperative. I mean, he listened to me. And then uh, I also saw that not only the programs, but the facilities. The facilities were not there. Sometimes 1 a.m. I'll be carrying tiles. Uh, to Sunyani, uh, <laughs> supervising the, the tiles, everything. Initially, I was even sweeping my own uh, office and the bungalow that was given to me also. Uh, some people were afraid to even to live there. That is more <laughs> of a spiritual thing than... Well, they said, hey, madam, you haven't seen anything here. I said, what do I have to see? They said, hey, this place, sometimes during the day you will see fire burning but hey. there is no fire so i said oh ever since i came those people have left they, they are not coming again and then so you see that you have spiritual thing uh, to to work and then also you know sometimes there are tribal sentiments you know somebody who is not from the place mm -hmm. uh, th this kind of mentality should go but i was not bothered because my father had told me that my grandfather was the first headmaster of the first government school in Sunyani. Oh, okay, wow. Yes, so, so <laughs> yes, so I said, uh, well, this is history. So it wasn't your first uh, encounter with Sunyani? Well, for me, uh, I would say it wasn't my first encounter, but I never went there when my grandfather was <laughs> in 1923 okay. when okay. he came. I wasn't even born, <laughs> okay. so I wouldn't know. And then I realized that that a word name I have is from. A word okay. in a, in the Sunyani area. The chief there was related to my husband. Interesting. So <laughs> my husband's uh, grandfather uh, was a brother to a former chief at a word So when I went there, they received me well. So the tribal things, I was fighting it, and everywhere I go, I met, I, I tell them who I am. Yeah, Prof, you were talking about some of the challenges you encountered in yes. the initial stages. <laughs> you talked about infrastructure, the fact that you had to carry mm -hmm. tiles from Kumasi to Sunyani sometimes and even supervise the tiling process, you sweeping your office and then all that. And also the issue, you having a very cooperative provisions line team who supported your vision. And uh, you did not leave out the spiritual <laughs> dimension <laughs> and the fact that they were suspicious that the grounds were being haunted or whatever. But being a woman of faith that you are, you, you called on the Lord to battle it out for you or on your behalf. And you were on the point of the subtle tribalism of the people wanting someone from the soil. And interestingly, you having roots even from your husband's side to some parts of the Bronhapu region, which kind of bridged the gap for you <laughs> because then you could associate or you could connect. Then you were on the point that you have always been an advocate against uh, tribalism. So maybe we could continue on that trajectory. Okay, so first of all, I have to say that I have to thank Nana Kuran. He received me as a wife and he brought me so many gifts uh, a sheep uh, plantains and another one is the chief yeah, of the chief of uh, a wood at that time okay he's no more and may he so rest in peace and the queen mother too of a wood mercy to his she's also no more they all brought me gifts and i really felt at home and then to be honest also, people on the council, the chiefs on the council, they really liked me. Uh, 
Nana Bofa was a lecturer here. And when he, w he was appointed, he became my friend. I didn't know that in future he will be on my council. <laughs> and then uh, Nana from the Mahin group, they really liked me. They supported me. And uh, Suma, my uh, chief also. And then uh, the Fiapre uh, people. So now, I am now a BA woman. That is what I said at that time. <laughs> I now have another degree, BA to my uh, name. So I received them and they also received me. And I was very, very happy. It really surprised a lot of my, the challenges that uh, I faced. Let's face.